Hey, good afternoon, everyone. If you learned anything about Brian and our company, we're definitely flexible and adaptable. So that was a great job, Brian, for uh, getting through the presentation there with the issues. When Brian was recruited to help ADX get into machine learning, he had a vision for a platform. That platform would be streamlined, efficient, and powerful solution for a wide variety of people could get access to make great machine learning. Much of that vision came from his time when he was at the Machine Learning Society in New York, working with the teams there. He saw the difficulties the data scientists had in being able to get the important GPU compute power needed to make the best models. We'll discuss the challenges and some of the issues with those solutions today, but as an example, for these expensive GPU compute power, only 15% of it ever gets used. 90% of all models never get put to use. And data scientists are the most coveted engineering resource today. So the reality is only about 1% of our most desirable resource gets used. So we know we can do better than that. And that's why I joined Brian a few months ago after he started. Let's start with the discussion about this era of machine learning and what it can do for us. We'll also talk about some of the challenges and limitations. <clears throat> machine learning is often thought of as the math that creates cats from the internet. But the reality is machine learning can do a lot more. Today, if we look at the applications of machine learning, there are a lot of them just in your pocket. Credit card companies today are able to use machine learning to make fraud detection a reality, and that decision has to get made in less than 10 milliseconds. Pretty fantastic that you can apply machine learning in something that is so quick. It can be used in factories to determine product quality. In the automotive industry, it saves hundreds of thousands of dollars at these factories. People that work in the factories can take pictures of defects, they can send them back to the server networks, it can be annotated, and then that new information can be spread around the world to factories automatically. And maybe more interestingly, NASA and their satellite system, they're applying machine learning today to be able to predict the causes of forest fires in the Amazon. So officials can look at the ones that we think are man-made. And that data set is not looking at days or months, and it's tracking year over year changes in the Amazon to be able to make these types of predictions. Our NeuroThink platform will support all these types of models and categories of data. Let's just look at how powerful it is. Machine learning, especially deep neural nets, use a string of probabilities to come to most likely conclusion. We're talking hundreds of millions of calculations and suggested answers. But we need powerful computers to run these large, deep neural networks and also be able to do the reinforcement learning. The reinforcement learning means to be able to change these values millions of times to get to the right equations that are able to predict what we're looking for. And data sets actually need to be broad enough to not just care about what you are trying to categorize, but we want to uh, also include data that's outside what's intended. For example, if you're <clears throat> collecting uh, categorization for food, you may have to include data sets you don't even think about. And that's so that when you don't confuse your breakfast for your pet, this is, this is a real issue uh, in, in data analysis. In the last 10 years, the powers of these models is growing four times faster than it was in the previous 50. And this graph is on log scale. Every line is 10 times more powerful than it was before. So the last 10 years, we've been able to see the compute power to finally make these models a reality. But even with these most powerful GPUs and the cost coming down, cost to make the model is rising rapidly. It's in the millions of dollars at this point. And this means that these models are in the hands of a very small few set of people who can create them. NeuroThink is going to give greater access of these models to the rest of the world so these can be retrained and used in your business cases. The industries that can benefit from this are broad, and the promise of machine learning is it can cover a greater range of exploration than any group of humans. But it's not just machine learning. You need machine learning to stumble upon discoveries, and humans can then apply their intelligence, understanding, and guidance to make use of it. It's really a combination of the two. <clears throat> the opportunity 
is estimated to be an increase in the global GDP of $15 trillion in the next 10 years. And that's not just from quality or productivity, but it's in personalization of the products and solutions that are going to come from this. I'm going to go further in saying that this is not just a cost play. Machine learning can save this world. Let's just take an example. You don't have to go to Mars to discover new things. We only understand about 1% of the Earth. Most of the life on this Earth comes from the oceans. And we understand almost none of it. One of the companies we're working with that was just in Forbes last week, TerraDepth, they have a technology to persistently stay out in the ocean and collect data. Humans can't stay out in the ocean for very long. So with this type of technology, you need machine learning. Why? Because now these vehicles have to autonomously be able to navigate out there by themselves. They're collecting data, terabytes of data a day, petabytes over a week. You can't send that back on a satellite link. The data is out at the edge. So you need the machine learning also out at the edge to calculate and understand that's interesting. I want to save this data. I want to send back a signal. And then people can monitor that and redirect the autonomous vehicle to continue to collect data. And it's not just about mapping the oceans. It's about being able to track the aquatic um, species that are down there. And it's even uh, sensors to be able to look at salinity and temperature and carbon dioxide that's being absorbed in the ocean. And as you collect that data over time, we're going to start to understand how important the ocean is to us. Let's take a look <clears throat> at what one of the leading companies, OpenAI, doing is in AutoML. So they moved from just working in the digital space. They were able to take a robot arm from 15 years ago. They provided no special engineering constants. They used no robotics engineer. They used no kinematic equations. They went through progressive training of teaching the robot in the digital space with machine learning to hold something, not to crush it, not to drop it. They then progressively are able to advance that and teach it what a Rubik's Cube is. Then they're able to teach it how to solve the Rubik's Cube. But it's really teaching itself as it goes back and forth. And in each of these steps, what's new about this is they modify the data, it creates more variance, <clears throat> and then they retrain it and redeploy the model. The outcome is actually a fully functioning solution. What you see here with the plush giraffe is that it's changing the Rubik's Cube, but the robot arm just goes ahead and solves it. It was never trained to do this. It just knows how to do this because the models are becoming so robust. So the implications for real life business are awesome because now machine learning models can work in more unexpected situations than ever before. This didn't exist three years ago. What hurdles are we facing? So there's 100 billion stored and linked values that are hard to understand in these equations. We try to use methods like dimensionality reduction to understand them. We think about our own world that we live in. How many dimensions are we in? Three, up, down, left, right, forward, back. You're going to argue with me four. Time is another dimension. And there's color, maybe what we smell. There's like six or seven dimensions. These models have thousands and millions of dimensions. So fundamentally, it is a real issue and the founders of Darwin AI said, output alone is insufficient to understand what the model's doing. It's just very opaque by its nature. Let's just take a simple example. So here's a model that was, that, that was shown in KubeCon last year by a director at Microsoft. It's trying to determine husky or wolf. It's over 80% accurate. And this case, it got it wrong. So you say, why is that a husky and not a wolf? Why did the computer not get this right? What if this was a cancer image that was incorrect? from radiology. And you could say, well, maybe it's the eyes, maybe it's the ears, maybe it's the chain, if you look very carefully along the side. It turns out the model that was created wasn't determining husky and wolf, it was detecting snow. It had nothing to do with the intention of the way the model was created. Without this application to understand what the model was looking at, you never would have known. If you're in the finance industry trying to hand out loans, Maybe it makes a model based on how long you're on TikTok. It has nothing to do with your financial background. Now you're giving out loans based on things that are totally irrelevant. So the previous methods of doing this are just expensive, time-consuming, and never-ending. If you've ever had to take care of equations in business process or in factories, it's like a baby. You have to constantly tend them. So data lives in one location, and the compute power lives in another. 
and it just takes time and money to keep shuffling them back and forth. But there are newer ways to do this. These newer methods leverage computer chips that are at the edge. They're in your car, they're in your coffee machines now, they're in your refrigerator. Information is everywhere and the ability to make a decision is everywhere. So now in this new architecture, what we're able to do is push the machine learning model to the chip. You can make the decision at the place where something's happening. You have a self-driving car, what does it do at the intersection? It can make a decision. It doesn't have to go back to the internet. Um, just outside the water sprinklers were on here at 2 p.m. If you had a sensor in the ground, you could understand whether or not the ground was wet or dry. It can make a decision based on that. So when the model's at the edge, you can also customize the decision by region. If you're gonna have self-driving cars, you'd probably have different rules in China than you would in France, than you would in North America. And maybe in, you know, uh, upper state New York in the middle of winter, you'd have suggestions at night to be careful because of black ice if you've never driven there before. You don't want to drive off the road. So back to the vision about NeuroThink. Recently, Brian faced a question about why we are not doing just software, but we're putting software on top of uh, hardware and investing in expensive hardware. Because a lot of applications just go on top of the large cloud service providers. But we all know what's possible when a technology company is unified and they put the software and hardware together. In fact, most of you are either using that device now or it's in your pocket, right? This company knew that they had to put the software and hardware together, and now this is a digital twin of your life. It's not just a phone anymore. It's not even just a camera, it's your life. They knew where that was going. We know that we also have to do that. So we've been focusing on five pillars to build out our platform. We want it to be streamlined, we need to be innovative, has to be secure, we have to have edge to cloud. I talked about the edge devices, I talked about the compute power and bringing those together. And then we also need to develop a neighborhood for the data scientists. This year alone, we have a lot of compute power and it is fast. So four petaflops, what is that? Um, if each calculation was a kilometer. We could go back and forth to the moon a half a billion times in one second. That's how many calculations we can do on our software, on our servers. But we need to make it accessible. We need to, we need to make sure we use it more than 1% of the time like I talked about earlier. We have to be able to use it 95% of the time, which means getting a lot of people on and doing it securely. So what we start with are the powerful GPUs. We partner with NVIDIA and VMware to virtualize that solution. We customize the process, and then we can efficiently and effectively offer access to make, make amazing models, but also retrain those large, powerful models that I talked about earlier. Those will be on our platform, too. We securely offer each user their own containerized instance. This is through Kubernetes, and we built out our own UI UX to develop and train the models. Our product is the machine learning experience. It's not a layer on top of some storage platform. So we also have a sneak peek at the interface. This interface is gonna allow us to manage the machine learning, access persistent data on fast SSD drives, remember the instances that were run, al along with the parameters, allow you to promote your best model and then export that so you can go put it to use. Because that's the intention of all this is to be able to go use the models. This interface, looks nothing like you would see if you went to one of the existing providers and saw the myriad of screens, installation steps, and settings that you have to go through just to get your work started. And if you're a data scientist, you don't want to be spending your time doing that. So, NeuroThink is going to be publicly available in 2022, but we're going to have limited access available this year. If you're interested, contact us at info at neurothink.io. Thanks, and we'll see you at six o'clock up at the Vista. Thank <laughs> you.